Canada's continental divide. From glacial lakes and soaring peaks along the 49th parallel, to the British Columbia Alberta border region and beyond. A rare international frontier dedicated to peace. The cut line shows that difference of the two countries, but it's all one. Stories of natural disaster from the site of Canada's deadliest landslide. You're struck by the size of the boulders. And tragedy and triumph from the heart of the Great Divide. The mine blew up about 10 o'clock in the morning and took out 189 men. Now, we trace the secrets of the world's longest undefended border. More than 6,000 kilometers of rugged American frontier. Canada, over the edge. The Continental Divide, or Great Divide, marks a major hydrological division in the Western Hemisphere. It is the geographic point that determines the flow of all watersheds in the Americas. The divide stretches from the Bering Sea to the Strait of Magellan. Rivers to the west of the divide flow to the Pacific and east to the Atlantic. The Continental Divide traces the path of some of the most rugged and formidable landscapes in the world. Here, at the point where British Columbia and Alberta meet Montana, we begin a journey north along this great divide. My name is Barb Johnson. I'm an ecosystem scientist or part biologist here in Waterton Lakes National Park. Waterton is a small national park. It's only about 505 square kilometers, but the diversity here is immense. We have a really narrow spot in the Rocky Mountains. It's kind of a pinch point, so we have prairies meeting directly up with the high mountains here. Waterton's location is truly unique. It is set not only on the Continental Divide, but also on the Laurentian Divide, directing rivers west, east, and north. And we call this area the crown of the continent. And that's because we're at the apex of where three different river systems diverge. So we have waters flowing to the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, as well as up into the Hudson's Bay into the Arctic Ocean. Truly the crown of the continent and it's right at a continental divide. And Waterton lies directly across the 49th parallel from Montana's Glacier National Park. Together, the parks form a cross-border protected zone known as Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. So in 1932, it was created as the first international peace park in the world. Originally, it was created as a symbol of peace and cooperation between the two countries. 
that relationship's really grown, and now the two parks work really well together. The park draws visitors from around the world. Waterton is a spectacular place to come for day hikes. You can get right out from the prairies up to high alpine and some amazing alpine lakes. It's one of the highlights in Waterton. One great opportunity you have is visiting Upper Waterton Lake. It's an amazing feature in the park. Um, Waterton is the smallest national park in the Canadian Rockies, but it has the deepest lake. Upper Waterton Lake is 150 meters deep. Far below, one group prepares to experience the majestic waters of Waterton Glacier International Peace Park firsthand. American pilot Phil Rupel has been guiding visitors here for more than two decades. My name is Phil Rupel and I'm the captain of the MV International. You can see behind me and uh, we're about to embark on a two hour and 15 minute cruise of the upper Waterton Lake. And what makes the cruise uh, unique to this area, uh, just uh, not only is it a beautiful scenery, but uh, we're going to make our way down to the south end of the lake, which is actually located in Glacier National Park, uh, Montana, USA. So a real international voyage aboard the uh, MV International. M Well over 100 people, 150 people, we take uh, down on a particular trip, and it is a real popular way for people to, to see the park. You can sit right here if you want. You want to sit right here? Yeah, yeah. The MV International is a fixture on these waters, ferrying people across this marine boundary for more than 80 years. Because the, the, the boat again was built in 1927 and everything is pretty simple as the technology was at that time. We don't have the latest uh, that you might expect. Uh, we have cable steering, the cable goes through the floor. That's why the wheel is so big turning all that cable and about a three foot rudder at the very back. So that's, the wheel is not just for show, it is definitely is functional. And uh, shift levers, or shift levers and transmissions, uh, two engines, but every trip I have to, uh, before every length or every trip back up the lake, I have to reset the shift levers. So it's a little bit of that kind of thing, but again, everything is simple and straightforward. The vessel departs for the U.S. border and Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. Interpreter Keith Robinson prepares the guests for what they are about to see. We leave the Waterton Marina behind us here, travel all the way to the south end of the lake. Yep. We're going to Goat Hunt. That's the name of the tiny little backcountry ranger station. Goat Hunt, Montana, United States of America. The lake is more than 10 kilometers long and less than a kilometer wide. Today, in the heat of summer, its glacial waters register a frigid 12 degrees Celsius. This is a landscape that's been recently glaciated, so all the features you see, uh, big bowl-shaped valleys, the pinnacles uh, to the peaks, and the castle-like formations, and the valleys have a U-shape to them, and similarly, the lake does. If we could take the water out, it would look like uh, shaped like your bathtub. So not more than 10, 15 feet out from shore, uh, it drops off uh, very quickly. And 
in a couple of minutes, we're going to approach the international border. And as we approach the border, we're going to slow down. And you're going to see a cut line that goes up the uh, side of Mount Boswell to the left. And you'll see it up the Boundary Valley to the right. It's about 20 feet wide, and that marks the international border between Canada and the United States. On deck, people are amazed by the man-made imprint on this otherwise untouched landscape. Off the right-hand side, just starting to come into view now, tucked away amongst the trees, are a couple of obelisk survey markers. They're called obelisks. And you can see them now, two of them. When you line them up one in front of the other, that is going to be the surveyor's view of the 49th parallel north latitude. So right on the border. This is going to be the easiest border crossing you make anytime soon. Just this past week, the trail crew guys at the ranger station at the south end of the lake, they cleared the boundary up the east side. So you're gonna see, I mean, it's cut down to almost like your front lawn kind of thing. So it's really, um, it really stands out. Further south, the MV International reaches its destination, Goat Haunt, Montana. Because of its isolation, guests have the rare opportunity to set foot in America without going through border security. Well, this is uh, the Goat Haunt Ranger Station, again, uh, only accessible by trail or by boat. And this is the Peace Park Pavilion, built here in 1966. We just make a short stop, but this is U.S. soil. Back on the water, Captain Phil Rupel prepares to leave his native soil and head back to Canada. Kind of a unique experience for a lot of people to cross the border and uh, be in the United States and actually step on the soil at the south end of the lake. So, and it kind of shows the, uh, the idea of this whole, of the two national parks, that this is an international peace park, that uh, the ecosystem around us is the same, the mountains haven't changed, the landscape is the same on either side of the border. So the cut line kind of shows that difference of the two countries, but in a sense, it's all one kind of international peace park. Well, I've been doing this for 23 summers now. It's just, uh, take a look around. <laughs> It's a beautiful sight, and you know, never really get tired of it. It's not year-round. You know, basically we have three months of running boat tours on the lake, and then we're done and off to other places. So it's always a nice place to come back to, and uh, the people we work with, you know, we all have the same interests and values about the area. Everything we do here is pretty heartfelt, and it's uh, nice to meet people from all over the world and kind of share this part of the world that uh, we have here, and it's nice to share that with people from around the world, because uh, everybody is pretty much astounded by the whole setting here with the boat and the mountains and, uh, and the, the, the town side of Waterton and what it has to offer. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Waterton Lakes National Park sits directly on the Canada-US border and the Continental Divide. It is a small park measuring just over 500 square kilometers. But the region surrounding is equally stunning. To the west, Akamina Kishanina Provincial Park marks the southeastern tip of British Columbia. 
It is 100 square kilometers of soaring alpine ridges, deep valleys, and breathtaking colors. The park has served as a human migration route for thousands of years, connecting the Flathead River Valley to the west and the prairies to the east. Today, it continues to be an attraction for adventuresome travelers. The park is just one small section of the wider ecosystem known as the crown of the continent. It measures 72,000 square kilometers, covering parts of BC, Alberta, and Montana. One of the most famous mountain ecosystems in the world Continuing west, beyond the Flathead River Valley, we reach another border anomaly along the Canada-U.S. divide. This is Lake Kukanusa, straddling the British Columbia-Montana border. These pristine waters stretch 68 kilometers north of the 49th parallel and 77 kilometers below. is actually a reservoir formed by the construction of the Libby Dam on the Kootenai River in 1975. It was a massive effort shared by both countries with entire towns and a railway relocated in order to flood the area. The name of the lake, Kukanusa, is a combination of Kootenai, Canada, and the United States. Today, much of the shoreline remains undeveloped, making Lake Kukanusa a recreation paradise for boaters on both sides of this great international border. Life along the Great Divide attracts outdoor adventurers from around the world. But for all the wonders these landscapes provide, dangers exist throughout the region. Avalanches and landslides have been a concern since humans first set foot here. Today, this helicopter team is taking precautionary measures.
They are installing and monitoring a series of avalanche control pipes along the side of this mountain. The pipes are strategically placed in avalanche danger zones. Here, they protect the busy roadway below. Using a mixture of propane and oxygen, the pipes create explosions to dislodge small amounts of ice and snow. The goal is to prevent major buildups on these hillsides that could cause a large scale natural disaster. Sixty kilometers northeast of Lake Kukanusa, the community of Frank, Alberta, is a town that wasn't so lucky. Frank was the site of Canada's deadliest landslide. April 29th in 1903, at 4.10 in the morning, 90 million tons of rock came down on the sleeping town of Frank. At that time, Frank had about 600 people in it. Fortunately, out of those 600 people, 500 were out of the way. And it was just a little over 100 people who were actually in the path of the slide, and most of them died. It took just 90 seconds for the fortunes of Frank to change forever. 30 million cubic meters of rock fell. Enough rock to build a six meter high wall from Victoria, British Columbia to Halifax, Nova Scotia. When you wander through the Frank slide, you're struck by the size of the boulders. Some of them are as big as houses. And also by how far from the mountain the rock went. It's three kilometers from the top of the mountain going across the valley to the other side. The displaced rock moved at more than 100 kilometers per hour and was heard more than 200 kilometers away. Finally, years later, scientists can pinpoint the causes of this tragic event. The primary cause of the Frank slide was Turtle Mountain's unstable geological structure. During mountain building, layers of limestone had been pushed up into a big, upside down U-shaped fold. And thrust faulting, a break in the Earth's crust, had brought layers of rock up and over younger rock. And there was movement along that area during the mountain building. Other contributing factors were water getting into summit cracks and freezing and expanding, and also coal mining at the base of the mountain weakened what was already a very unstable natural situation. And by studying the culture of the region, it is clear the Frank slide may not have been the first time Turtle Mountain crumbled, and it may not be the last. Interestingly, early people traveling through the valley, the Tunaha and the Blackfoot, didn't tend to camp near Turtle Mountain and called it the mountain that moves. But the European settlers didn't know about these stories and didn't understand there was danger and they built their town right at the foot of Turtle Mountain. Since Turtle Mountain fell back in 1903, everybody has been wondering, will Turtle Mountain fall again? And the answer is yes. 
However, we don't know when. The timing is uncertain, but the same contributing factors that brought the mountain down in 1903 will bring more pieces of the mountain down. But Frank residents can rest easy. With a high-tech monitoring system in place, Frank Slide 2 shouldn't take anyone by surprise. The monitoring project has established over 80 sensors on the mountain in overlapping networks. And that's so that you can measure movement across different kinds of sensors. And all of these sensors are taking the mountain's pulse and they are detecting movements as small as the thickness of a dime. And the idea is that no one needs to die next time, that we will know that Turtle Mountain is going to fall and we'll be able to evacuate people and manage the risk of the next rock avalanche. The town of Frank sits in the heart of a region known as Crow's Nest Pass. It is on the eastern edge of the Great Divide and has served as a human migration corridor for thousands of years. The pass features multiple small communities, including Blairmore, Coleman, and the village of Bellevue. Bellevue was founded in 1905 with the opening of a coal mine. Coal quickly became big business, drawing laborers from across Canada. Name's Ron Price and uh, uh, I'm from the Crow's Nest Pass and I've been a coal miner here for some odd many a year. Crow's Nest Pass is one of the most beautiful, well-claimed, renowned places and pretty well anywhere in Western Canada. My dad here was, came here in the early 1900s from Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia. And uh, he was a miner as well as myself. Today, the Bellevue Mine Museum preserves the coal legacy of Crow's Nest Pass. Ron Price is retired, but continues a daily inspection here, monitoring carbon monoxide levels and ensuring safe conditions for visitors. What I do here is I go in in the morning, I just check on things. Because I take my, a, a monitor, which is to check for gases or any CO or anything like that, and they check on the timbers, make sure that the, the wedges and everything's nice and tight on them. Oh, I'm just putting a belt on for my lamp so I'm able to see what uh, we're all heading in there. It's quite dark, but as dark as you can ever uh, quite imagine, it was good. And here we have a monitor, and I turn this on, which I will do once I get out of here, because if I set it off, turn it on in here, it'll just go off, and you know, it'll just make a bunch of noise, so. I'm ready to head out to the mine if everyone else is. Well, we'll just turn on the monitor here. Does a little bit of beeping all the time. It's calculating right now. The levels are and good. And we'll go one more and then we'll hit it. And then it goes on. Price teams up with fellow miner Daryl Saray and they head into Bellevue. Hey, well, this is one of the places that we usually kind of have a look around here and make sure that everything's nice, tight, tight, and secure. We got our Nova Scotia hitch here. It goes right into the rib there nice, so it holds more tight all the way around, all solid all the way around. Well, it keeps the water off their backs anyway. Eh? It wasn't raining. A lot of water was here. It's pretty well dried up now where it used to be. Here the roof is way better, stronger than ever. Got a little look 
at that. See, she's really not bad, eh? It's good, good there. Eh? You better see open that bad. No, the CO is a little bit, but all reading's good. Yep. A little bit of CO, but nothing serious. The Bellevue mine was finally closed in 1961. Price and Saray continued to work in the industry for decades. Now, a stroll through these cold, dark recesses unlocks memories. Right in this area was where we loaded the coal cars, and there'd be a fella up there lifting up that, well, they'd drop what this is called your apron, next is your, your shoe wall, yeah. And uh, just up and down on that, and then they load your cars, you'd take about 16 of cars as an average and load them all up and then trip them out and bring in another 16 in. Uh, the boys were on contract mining back then too, a lot of them, and they were making pretty good money when they were on contract driving these raises. They were uh, probably getting somewhere from anywhere from 30 to 40 ton in a day. Okay, I'm just gonna go up into this one raise here and check on it, see how that top goal is, if it fell down or anything. She's a little low and tight in here, but nothing too serious. Uh, got a little rope for whoever. This goes up quite a ways, and then just so all this top coal fell a long time back. Alrighty, that looks all good, good. Bellevue's darkest moment came December 9th, 1910, when 31 miners were killed in an explosion one of several disasters to impact the region. For Price, inspecting Bellevue is a way to give others a window into life underground. I believe that any mine should always have a, a safety inspection. There's been quite a few disasters here. Uh, there was two here, explosions, uh, one in Hillcrest. The one in Hillcrest mine, that was in 1914. And my dad and his dad were on the night shift, but the mine blew up about 10 o'clock in the morning from methane gas and took out 189 men. It was, uh, it was a very sad event. Here has been uh, a lot of grief. There's been a lot of grief through the years. and. But with newer technology and stuff and everything else, it's, and the mines now, there's no more underground. They've given that up pretty well completely. Yeah, but it also is nice to be part of the heritage, and it's also kind of proud to be raised and brought up here in the crow's nest. Not bad. How are you guys doing? Good, thanks. Perfect. Enjoy the visit? It's amazing. Very good. Seventy-five kilometers northwest of Crow's Nest Pass, we explore the western boundary of the Continental Divide. Far below lies the Kootenai River. This 780 kilometer long waterway gradually winds its way west to the Pacific, like all other rivers this side of the divide. Next, the community of Canal Flats sits at the southern end of Columbia Lake. Columbia Lake is the source of the mighty Columbia River. Like the Kootenai, it flows through Canada and the United States to Astoria, Oregon, on the West Coast. 
The lake is 13 kilometers long with shallow crystal blue waters, the warmest lake in the East Kootenai region. Just north of the lake, we reach the community of Fairmont Hot Springs. A century ago, Fairmont Hot Springs was just a small stop on a stagecoach route. Today, it is home to several hundred residents. But its resort and golf courses draw vacationers from North America and Europe. Further northwest, along the contours of the Columbia River, we reach the shores of Windermere Lake. The lake is actually a widening of the Columbia and was once known as Lower Columbia Lake. Windermere Lake is also a hotspot for recreational boaters, just a short drive over the mountains from the city of Calgary. At the northern edge of the lake lies Invermere, It is a larger center, surrounded by unique landscapes. And a railway continuing north to Radium Hot Springs and beyond. To the east, the hills rise as we leave Invermere behind, en route to stunning Kootenai National Park.
Here, at the southwestern entrance to the park, Douglas fir and ponderosa pine trees line the base of these peaks. Further north, beyond Mount Kindersley, the summits of the Rocky Mountain Range rise high. Kootenai National Park measures more than 1,400 square kilometers. The gateway to the stunning continental divide. The mountain landscape leading from Waterton Glacier International Peace Park to Kootenai National Park on the western edge of the Continental Divide is a remarkable geographic journey. and it leads to one final mountain paradise. Banff National Park. Further north along the Rocky Mountain chain, you'll encounter Banff National Park, the flagship park of our national park system. It's found along the east slopes of the Continental Divide. The park measures more than 6,600 square kilometers and was established in 1885. It was created originally to celebrate a hot springs that was found there. Now it celebrates the Rocky Mountains. It's about 37% rock and ice. It has hundreds of glaciers, it has mountain goats it's up in the high alpine. It has elk out on the grasslands. And in the heart of this awe-inspiring landscape lies the town that helps make Banff one of the most popular parks on earth.
Banff town is nestled right in the mountains. It's a small town of about 9,000 people. Visitors come from all over the world to visit Banff National Park, partly because of the natural splendor and the wildlife opportunities, but also to visit the town site itself. Banff National Park is a world-famous landmark on the eastern boundary of the Continental Divide. Its incredible architecture, spectacular vistas, and first-class recreation opportunities make it the gem of the Canadian National Park System. It has become one of Canada's most sought-after destinations, seemingly on top of the world. From the 49th parallel, and the soaring peaks of the crown of the continent, to the incredible cultural stories of Crow's Nest Pass, to Canada's awe-inspiring national parks lining the Rocky Mountains. The landscape along the Continental Divide is truly remarkable in the world. With vast, endless valleys, winding international rivers, stories of hardship and perseverance. This is North America's true geographic frontier. Here, on the edge of Canada. <laughs>